Hi, friends. I'm excited to share this podcast episode with you. In it, our good friend Brigitte Mars, herbalist and author, is talking about the possibility that the cannabis plant is actually the tree of life referenced in so many different cultural traditions. She brings together not only her herbal medicine knowledge, but also elements from the archaeological record to make a very compelling presentation. Today's episode's a bit different than usual in that she'll be presenting directly with some beautiful visuals. And I just wanted to give you a heads up that what she's talking about and what she's sharing with us may be uh, pushing the envelope for some of us. And we may be uh, encountering terms and concepts we're not super familiar with. So I just invite you to approach all of this with an open mind and open heart and uh, be willing to go along for the ride. And I think you'll find you you'll learn something for sure and uh, probably have a few moments of uh, food for thought and I'll tell you one thing I know is certain uh, I have not yet met a person who is completely uh, certain in an understanding of our history and prehistory several thousand years ago there's been so much debate and evolution over the last several decades regarding our combined and collective history and this is something we're all still exploring together. So a challenge to you is that if any of you out there do have 100% certainty on uh, what was going on several thousand years ago, give me a holler. You could be a guest on the episode. And until then, hope you enjoy this one. And uh, uh, without any further ado, here is Brigitte Mars presenting the cannabis plant as the tree of life. Take it away, Brigitte. Welcome to the Why on Earth Community Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron William Perry, and today we're visiting with my dear friend, Brigitte Mars. Hi, Brigitte. Hello. It's my pleasure and honor. Thank you. Thank you. We're so excited about this very special conversation about the cannabis plant. Brigitte Mars is an herbalist and nutritional consultant of natural health with almost 50 years of experience. She teaches herbal medicine at Naropa University and the School of Health Mastery in Iceland. She has taught at Omega Institute, Esalon, Kripalu, Shivananda Yoga Ashram, Arise, and Vision and Unify Festivals, and the Mayo Clinic. She is a professional member of the American Herbalist Guild. And Brigitte is the author of many books. Fourteen. Fourteen books, including the Natural First Aid Handbook, the Home Reference to Holistic Health and Healing, The Country Almanac of Home Remedies, and one of my favorites, The Sexual Herbal. Uh, Brigitte just told me today she's now working on her latest project, a racy 60s memoir. Yes, Wildflower Child, A Tale of <laughs> Sex, Psychedelics, and Natural Foods. <laughs> it sounds wonderful. And uh, she also collaborates with, <clears throat> with her children and uh, is educating and having beautiful impact on so many herbalists all around the planet. And so it's a real pleasure to have this opportunity, uh, Brigitte, to hear from you about uh, this cannabis as the tree of life idea. Thank you so much, Aaron. So it is, again, my delight to be here. And as Aaron has mentioned, I studied plants, you know, it's actually like over 60 years now. Really, I started as a child. And I was raised with a Catholic mother and a Jewish father. I went to all my friends' churches growing up just to you know, meet more people and find out, because my parents said, we need you to find your spiritual path on your own. They decided they weren't going to direct me. I studied Eastern religion in boarding school, and I wrote papers on Hinduism, Buddhism. I teach at a Buddhist university, Naropa University. And through all the world religions, I have seen that there's a similarity. There's many, many tales of some tree that was going to help humanity. So it is not my intention to convert people. My intention is really to explore the spiritual traditions of as many world religions as possible and their connection to the lore, legend, and mythology of the Tree of Life. So I certainly know that if I were going to another planet and I could bring one plant with me, I can't think of another plant that has more uses 
then cannabis sativa. And when I heard about a plant in the Bible where they talk about the leaves shall be for the healing of, na of the nations, I've always been wondered, wouldn't it be great if there was a plant that could truly help heal our nations? So we begin. So one of the many influences of all the world religions I've been exposed to is a book called the Urantia Book, which claims to be written by celestial beings and brought here to uplift the evolution of the planet. I've been reading this book since I was 19, and you can see it's pretty large. It's been translated into 30 or 40 languages, and the word Urantia means earth. So some of the spiritual traditions that I talk about come from this book, but I want to say that there's none of these traditions that come outright and say, what is the tree of life? This is simply my uh, research and exploration. So we do know that in the Bible they talk about every, in Genesis, every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, uh, you know, has value. There was no mention of like, but don't use that one. Now, the Urantia book does talk about a natural progression of evolution on this planet that came from uh, primates, and that is a whole other story. But I like to infuse the idea that perhaps there are truths in evolution and creation, truths in both of those. Now, many of us love these stories that we see on TV, ancient civilizations, ancient aliens. Who were they? Why were they here? Where did they go? What was all that about? Hmm. If you find this interesting, and many of us do, uh, you uh, might be interested to know that the Urantia book talks about a group of celestial beings, a hundred of them, from different worlds came to our planet Urantia about half a million years ago. And uh, again, throughout history, on every continent, we see images and imagery and hear stories about visitors from other worlds. So perhaps. Now it is interesting that cannabis has uh, very few relatives on this earth. Hops is the other closest relative to cannabis, which has long ruled the airwaves. Hops uh, is a sedative and an antimicrobial agent. And I recently heard that hackberry is also in that family. I'm not sure I agree with that, but you know, I'm not truly a botanist, I'm a medical herbalist, so we'll see about that. Um, it is also interesting that cannabis has male and female plants. There are other plants that have that type of uh, diversity, ginkgo trees, for example, but even nettles, male and female plants, but you know, it is interesting. It seems that a lot of the cultivation of cannabis in modern times is just the female plants, but the male plants, which we can use as hemp, it really doesn't matter if it's male or female because all of the industrial uses of cannabis, um, it really doesn't matter about THC content. You're looking for fibers and um, oil content of the seeds. Now, it is interesting that this plant from this tiny little seed can grow as tall as a tree in one season. That's amazing. I mean, how long does it take an um, apple tree to get that tall? I know sunflowers are, can get that tall, but they certainly don't look like a tree. So you will see on the board here some quotes from the Urantia book. I'm not going to read the quotes, but um, a lot of the things that don't um, they list what page it's on or what section of the book. Um, so I would say what section if you want to understand more. Now, most of you, I assume if you are watching this uh, program, you know that cannabis uh, can be used to make rope, fiber, fuel, fabric. It can help heal so many of our environmental problems. And we know that there are so many of them. But it is interesting that one of the oldest mummies on the face of the earth was buried in a hemp shroud. It's interesting, this mummy was found in China and had red hair. And there have been many, many mummies, ancient mummies, found with bags of either cannabis weed or even cannabis seed. 
Yes, they don't always report that in the scientific magazines just because they don't want to get the school children too riled up, but I'm telling you, it's there. Uh, and the cannabis leaves can be used for animal food. The seeds can be used as a high protein food. Uh, cannabis seed is said to be the highest source of vegetable protein on the planet next to soybeans. But we know that soybeans are one of the most genetically modified plants on the planet and many people have allergies to soy or find it difficult to digest. So a digestible vegetarian protein, and, you know, need I add that in 1941, Henry Ford made a car where the body was made mostly out of hemp and that it was fueled on hemp. I mean, truly paint, varnishes, oil, uh, airplane fuel. There's a lot we could do with this plant, but it competes with many, many industries. Well, one culture in Africa, the Dagon people, believe that they were visited by a group of extraterrestrials from a planet called Canis Minor, also known as the Two Dog Star. Hmm, Two Dog. Doesn't cannabis, Canis, hmm, and bis mean bi, like two, like biennial or bicentennial? Hmm, interesting, cannabis, hmm. Well, the Dogon people, hmm, from the Dog Star, hmm. Anyways. These people uh, believe that they were visited by extraterrestrials who taught them about cannabis. And I believe that this is one of the earliest cultures that have invented uh, a certain kind of pipe that was used for smoking cannabis. And they like to dress up in their festivals and honor these celestial visitors that came to visit them. It's also interesting that they knew about this companion planet to Sirius hundreds of years before it was discovered by scientists, but yet they knew it was there. Go figure. Ah, well, you know, this book that I read, the Urantia book, it talks about evolution and then these extraterrestrials came and about half a million years ago, around the same time that the celestial visitors came, there had a natural progression and evolution where in one family were born children of different hues red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and indigo. Wow, all born in one family. I like that idea. So remember the ETs are here and they brought a plant with them, a shrub of Edentia that grows throughout the universe. Well, if these celestial beings were coming here to civilize humanity and teach them about things like weaving and uh, animal husbandry and hygiene and trade and government and education and, you know, perhaps the, the alphabet, what plant could have, you know, showed them how to clothe these people, have lamp oil in their huts, um, have building material, another use from hemp. You've probably heard of hempcrete, a breathable, fireproof building material. Well, it's just uncanny, yes. Well, Carl Sagan, who I happen to know, was a cannabis user. As a matter of fact, he is the mysterious Dr. X that Dr. L uh, Lester Grinspoon writes about in his book, Marijuana Reconsidered. There was a mysterious Dr. X who was a cannabis user, and it was Carl Sagan. Yes, he used to have his own TV show and wrote Cosmos and talked about billions and billions of worlds. Really cool scientist, dude, also a cannabis user. But he believes that cannabis is perhaps the oldest cultivated plant on the face of the earth. And the word sativa actually does mean with a long history of cultivation. Yes, there are a few other plants that have sativa like alfalfa, medicago sativa, and oats, avena sativa, garlic, allium sativa, but I can just think of, you know, a few of these long history of cultivation plants. So again, here's a plant that could help humanity feed their animals, feed their families. Now, if we look at the ancient Babylonian clay tablets, which uh, people have seen in museums and we certainly have pictures. The one in the top left is actually a modern re rendition, but um, most of these other pictures are actually uh, uh, rock carvings that depict perhaps extraterrestrials guarding this plant. 
perhaps the tree of life. I mean, they are guarding it. And you see these two like bird beings, you know, they were able to fly, travel throughout the worlds. They're holding these pine cone symbolic things, which might relate to the pineal gland, some believe. Um, but again, you know, in the top right, you see these like kind of, you know, goat humans guarding this plant. And then uh, on the, the, right next to that, you see how like these fish beings, like these, hmm, maybe hybrid creatures, who knows? But they're often depicted guardi guarding or standing over this tree of life. And then you might also notice that in some of the pictures, there's like a celestial being, like a bird above the plant, maybe signifying that it is a plant that comes from another planet. Now, on the very bottom right, I have a picture of um, cannabis sativa. It is the oldest drawing known of cannabis sativa done by the herbalist uh, Dioscorides, who went on a battle tour with N uh, Nero when he was uh, conquering Rome and uh, Roman Empire lands for the Republic. Um, but here we have a picture that you might see looks a little bit like some of these other pictures, uh, perhaps. So the Bible and the Urantia book and many world tales talk about a war in the heavens. Hmm, we hear about the Nephilim mated with the humans. They saw that the daughters of humans were fair and took them to be their mates. So a seventh race was created called the Nodites. Hmm, the Nodites. Well, another story that really talks about this war in the heavens is the Star Wars story a battle of good and evil, because that's really what it comes down to. And uh, according to many traditions, there was an actual battle. The Urantia book says we were not the only planet involved in this war in the heavens, but of the 100 celestial beings that came to visit our world, 60 of them joined the Lucifer rebellion and 40 stayed loyal to the creator. What would you do? Well. I think maybe a lot of people didn't know what to do and what was the right choice. Um, and this was not only a war of the humans, but also celestial beings. And it pervaded, um, it affected several hundred planets. And because of this, our planet, Urantia, became quarantined. We stopped having the free and easy communication with other worlds that many other worlds enjoy. Well, it's possible, and perhaps I'm just a bit disgruntled with the state of world affairs, but is it possible that some of these celestial beings became or at least influenced some of the countries becoming their leaders, their kings, their emperors, but also perhaps contributing to raping and pillaging the land, really enslaving the humans? Is it possible? And then we did hear that these celestial beings, some of them mated with the humans, creating a seventh race. Maybe even those people were considered gods and heroes, the mighty men of old that you hear about in all the legends. So we do hear about corruption happening on our planet. We do hear about the destruction of our planet. And we wonder, how could it get this far? How could we allow things that we know are destroying the Earth to be happening? Especially when it's so obvious it comes down to profit and greed and not respect for the universal Mother Earth. So, um, yeah, war in the heavens. Well, someone stayed loyal to the Creator. I consider Van the steadfast, one of my eternal heroes, though we've never met yet. But he kept the tree of life safe. He was also a celestial being, an extraterrestrial, who moved the tree of life several times to keep it safe. And at one time lived in Turkey. There's a lake named after him called Lake Van. And uh, I, I'm going to say about 2018, maybe 2019, they found one of the oldest castles on the planet underneath, underneath Lake Van. Um, so there's a picture of Lake Van there in the center. So Van kept the Tree of Life safe, and he had a human consort named Amadon. And Van was a very high order of beings, and he knew that we were going to get uh, 
another epical revelation. The first epical revelation was the extraterrestrials coming, and the second epical revelation were two other celestial visitors, Adam and Eve, were celestial beings from the star system Edentia, perhaps. And they came here, and they a uh, garden was made ready, and Van helped to get groups of volunteers together to make this garden ready. Where was this garden? Well, we don't know exactly, but according to the research of Robert Sarmast, he wrote a book called The Discovery of Atlantis. Plato's description of Atlantis totally matches the Urantia book's description of the first Garden of Eden, located in the northeastern Mediterranean near right near where Cyprus is, but it's an area that's now underwater. Hmm. So they planted the tree of life there on the first garden, an area that's now underwater near Cyprus in the northeastern Mediterranean. So when Adam and Eve arrived here on this planet, quite recently actually, about 38,000 years ago, they were not considered, at least by my research, the first humans, they came much later. But um, the people, the beings on the world, they thought Adam and Eve were gods. They wanted to worship them. And of course, Adam and Eve, you know, being humble, they were already in a relationship on their other planet, already had children there. They were geneticists. They were eight feet tall. They were said to be of the violet race. They said, we're not gods. We're here to work for God. But they flew on birds. Uh, they could fly 500 miles in a day, uh, two people at a time on these huge birds called fandors. But you know what? A lot of our tales of these gods and goddesses that we're talking about Aphrodite and Venus or Astarte or Ashera are many tales of gods and goddesses, Apollo, they who came from the stars, star beings. Hmm, interesting. There's that tree again with the celestial bird over it. Now, Adam and Eve lived peacefully in this garden and they were said to be immortal. They were supposed to eat from the tree of life every day and they also were raw foodist. They are also said to have imbibed space emanations like light and perhaps neutrino streams into their being. So, you know, when I, the, the Urantia book describes cannabis, uh, or it describes the tree of life, forgive me. Cannab they describe the tree of life as a super chemical storage battery. But when I think of this little tiny seed that can grow as tall as a tree in one season and do all these things and be so high in protein, well, I could see how it perhaps was a super chemical storage battery. Because to me, as a medical herbalist and a nutritional consultant, I think of uh, super chemical storage batteries going to be some kind of plant that serves so many nu nutritional needs. So I early on wrote a hemp cookbook, and we know that it contains a type of protein called edistine. It has uh, excellent profile of essential fatty acids, high in omega-3s, more than omega-6s. Like, it meets all the criteria. The leaves are high in beta carotene, and you might have even heard of people you know, finding out that they can cure themselves of different diseases using cannabis. I could see why that might be a problem. That completes, competes with a lot of industry. But in any ways, one of my favorite uses of cannabis is to drink a juice from the fresh leaves, which is not psychoactive, but makes you feel really energized. Super chemical storage battery, perhaps. So again, we celebrate Easter, Astarte, the celebration of nature returning to the earth. This is wrapped up, they were celebrating Easter, the return of spring, many years before the birth of Jesus, but this rebirth, and so the symbols of the egg and honoring of the, the feminine principles, the flowers, the tulips. Well, there was one thing Adam and Eve were not supposed to do. And I know you all heard the story, they weren't supposed to eat the fruit, but maybe that was just symbolic. I've heard 
from my sources that they were supposed to wait till they had a million offspring in their garden and then their offspring were supposed to go out of the garden and mate with all the different races. But they kind of got seduced. Hmm. Oh, the slide I'm just going to throw in here. Another one who came from the stars, Tara, the a Buddhist goddess of compassion and healing, Tara, also said to be a star being. Well, so Adam and Eve were told, like, don't mate with the mortals because we really want your genetics to be super strong so you'll be resistant to disease, so you have great health and be beautiful and intelligent and spiritually receptive. Hmm. But, you know, that trickster, remember uh, those, Eve, those people that joined the Lucifer Rebellion? Well, one in particular, the prince, Caligastia, would visit Adam and Eve in the garden and convinced Eve that it would be a really great thing if she made it with this half-human, half-extraterrestrial uh, being named Kano. Hmm, so she did. Hmm. And that begat a child named Cain. In case you were wondering where where things went wrong with Cain. Well, he probably got taunted as like, you're not Adam's son. But when Adam found out that his mate had done the one thing they were asked not to do, well, what would you do? Well, I don't know what you would do, but Adam went off with Lilith, who might also be called Laota. But he went off with this other half-human, half-celestial being, came back a month later with the now pregnant Laota. Hmm. So it's interesting. We have a story about Eve and Adam eating an apple. We also have a story about Snow White eating an apple and falling into a deep sleep. We also have a story about Sleeping Beauty pricking her finger on a spinning wheel, which is very symbolic of mixing of the blood. Hmm. We also have the story about Persephone descending into the underworld. So the story goes that after Adam took off for a month, Eve became the story that we've heard about the descent of Inanna, the descent of our earth into winter time where nothing bloomed and everything was covered in snow. And then Adam came back a month later with the pregnant Lilith and they heard a voice in the garden, an angel that said, you have hours to get out of here. You are not permitted to bring the core of the tree of life with you. But we suggest you get ever whatever roots, bulbs, and seeds you can collect, and we suggest you head eastward. So Adam and Eve, Lilith, the other woman, and as many of their kids that were over, I think over age 16, um, the younger kids went back to their, the home planet, Edentia. Hmm. And the older kids got to decide. Well, so they lost a lot of their tribe, and they were suggested that they should head eastward. Well, they couldn't bring the core of the tree of life. But if you told me I could not bring the core of that awesome peach tree that I planted in my yard, I would figure out something. I would bring a seed or I'd bring some cuttings or I'd bring some root parts or I would find a way. Well, it's a good news that cannabis clones very easily. It doesn't take that much to, you know, cut off some leaves and you know, do some kind of magic and it grows roots. Next thing you know, a lot of the plants that people are currently using come from clones and not even seeds. Notice how the seeds have gotten so expensive. Huh, the genetics are getting really controlled. I remember in the 60s, we used to throw those things off the porch. Well, so supposedly towards the end of Adam and Eve's life, oh, the pregnant Lilith, she died in childbirth, and Eve so mercifully took that child, a girl, Sansa, to her breast and nursed her. Um, also, the story goes that they did an artificial insemination program with women of all the different races. No, Adam didn't get to have sex with all the women. He, it was overseen by Eve, and sometimes we see these pictures of these, you know, women lining up. There's some kind of like vial and tree. Anyways, let's just start looking into this. So it was much more difficult in the second garden. They had to work by the sweat of their brow. It wasn't a paradise. There was a lot of other beings there, some good, some not so good. Uh, they went to where the Tigris-Euphrates River meet. This is an area we also regard as Mesopotamia or Babylon. You know, sometimes we talk about Babylon being sort of like, you know, not a really ideal thing. There's a lot of um, sin and iniquity and, you know, things going on. But in any case, 
got to work with what you got. So um, we also have the story in the Bible and the Urantia book that uh, when older, I believe when they were you know, teenagers, Cain killed his brother Abel. And this is very unfortunate. Um, he, they argued over whose sacrifice was better than the other. And you know, they, no sacrifice was practiced in the first Garden of Eden. But when they got to the second garden, Adam and Eve were so busy, you know, just trying to keep the show going and the ship afloat that they um, really weren't able to give spiritual teaching to their kids. So they kind of reverted back to what the people were doing, you know, making sacrifices. And so Cain killed his brother Abel. And um, the Bible says after that, he went into the land of Nod and found a wife. So there's a big hint there that perhaps there were other celestial beings here on the planet, or other beings, um, the seventh race, the Nodites, the Nephilim that had mated with the humans. So one theory that was also explored by uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Sarmast is that a lot of our mythologies about Cain might also translate to the Chiron Hmm, the half human, half beast, or perhaps is he half human, half God? You know, in mythology, we hear about Chiron being the son of Diana. And Diana, perhaps, is another name for she who came from the stars Diana, Athena, um, the, you know, Selene, one goddess, many names. Um, so, Chiron this half human, half beast, or perhaps half human, half God, because Cain, when he went into the land of Nod, he really used what he had, which was like he was the son of this celestial being, Eve, Mother Eve, who, you know, many parts of the world knew about the legend because Adam and Eve uh, lived for several hundreds of years on the planet. It is interesting, too, the word Cairo means hand. A chiropractor is one who heals with his hands. And if you know anything about the structure of the cannabis leaf, it is a palmate leaf shaped like the palm of the hand. So it's believed that this character of the half human, half beast might also carry over into some of the mythologies we have about the green man, Peter Pan, uh, Coca Pelli, the uh, Pied Piper, uh, the Satyr, Bacchus, Dionysus, you know, those that maybe knew about the secret magical plants. I mean, these beings all had special powers. I mean, Peter Pan could teach you to fly. Uh, the Pied Piper kept Valerian in his pocket and led the children out of Hamlin because the townspeople didn't pay him for getting the rats out. And, you know, Bacchus and Dionysus, they kind of like, you know, the gods of wine and many scholars say that it was cannabis infused wine but um, you know sort of uh, representing the wildness the green man you know again you see many of these half human half god they play the flute hmm yeah Krishna and Kokopelli, they all play the flute and in Tantra the word playing the flute has uh, phallic connotations if you know what I mean well, perhaps Cain became the father of the Canaanites, who were very, very discriminated against. But I know if one of my children had to leave home on a vast, unknown part of the planet, what would be one of the most precious things I could give them, especially, you know, 38,000 years ago, around about, would be some hemp seeds, because then they could help civilize the part of the world they were going to and teach those people how to make food and fuel and fabric and lamp oil and you know protein and all those amazing things. Well, I don't know as much about Nordic mythology, but I did like watching the Vikings on the history station. It's really violent, but it was awesomely spiritual too. They talk about a world tree, Yggdrasil, and uh, you know, it's interesting, some say it's an ash tree, or, but it is interesting uh, that they have a Nephilim, the world of the uh, celestial beings that perhaps joined the rebellion. They also have a Vanahim, remember Van the Steadfast, who kept the Tree of Life safe. They also have an Elfheim, and you know, I teach in Iceland, so I know about the elves. They um, really make a lot of it. And I actually have photographs, but that's another 
class. Um, so there's a lot of similarities to the Nordic mythology about the tree of life as well as South American. Even the Mayan tradition has a tree of life. They also have their cosmic serpent, tree, Quetzalcoatl. Uh, again, these are all areas I would like to explore more. But for now, I just want to point out that there's many correlations in the traditions of spirituality that talk about a world tree and the different levels of ascension by elevating and using this tree for progress and evolution. Now, moving over to India, in the Hindu tradition, uh, they have a trinity, Brahma, the supreme creator. They have uh, Vishnu, and they also have Brahma, um, uh, Shiva. So Shiva is said to be Lord of the dance. He's the creator and destroyer, but they all work together, just like, you know, the Holy Trinity we have um, on, you know, many other continents. But Shiva, he used to go and cavort around with the maidens and the nymphs, and his consort Parvati did not really like that. So she uh, had access to a plant, cannabis. Here's a little picture right there of her handing him. Wow, look at that, it's a young cannabis leaf. So the story goes that when he came back from his cavorting, she offered him some cannabis and they partook of it. And he was so blissed out, not only did he become more faithful, supposedly one hopes, but he declared that it should be available for all his devotees. So his devotees include the sadhus of India, these holy men, these very often men that had great careers who forsake all material, uh, attachment and cover themselves with ashes from the funeral pyre and I know it sounds weird but they smoke the chillum and the word chillum means chalice and uh, they they sing their praises to Shiva they often say before they smoke Bom Shiva Shankar Hari Hari Ganja Bom Shiva Shankar Hari Hari Ganja or Hail Hail Ganja Bom Shiva Shankar Hari Hari Ganja and um, you often see pictures of Shiva holding a shell. Huh, and if you notice, the shell is filled with a green liquid, and that liquid is known as bong, B-H-A-N-G. Not bong, like B-O-N-G, but bong is a sort of a chai-like beverage that's made with cinnamon and cardamom and, you know, ginger and cannabis. Hmm. And it's also interesting, you see this picture on the bottom middle of Shiva, and he wears a top knot in his hair, and there's a river that comes out of his top knot, and it is the Ganges River. Hmm. Ganges, that does sound a little bit like Ganja, and this Ganges River is associated with a goddess named Ganga, or Ganja. Hmm. And on the holy day, they, uh, you know, throw colored powders on each other after drinking copious amounts of bong. And of course, we've all heard of the Ganges River being a river that is considered a sacred river of purification. So I think that till the end of time, scholars will debate what is the Soma that is talked about in the Rig Vedas. Well, I've heard it all. Is it Peganum Harmala? Is it Psilocybin? Is it Amanita Muscaria? Is it um, Sy Sy Syrian Rue? What is this uh, tree of life? Uh, what is this uh, Soma? We do know from the Vedas that it is psychoactive, that it affects people's consciousness. Well, Chris Bennett, who I consider a great scholar, wrote a book called Cannabis and the Soma Solution. And even though I've read The Mushroom and the Cross and many other scholarly works on just what might be Soma, I'm convinced that Chris Bennett has done his research. So if you want to know more, yeah, I'm, I'm on that team. Um, I just want to say that cannabis has long been part of the sacred herbs of India and trying to make it illegal, it's a little late for that because it helps people so much. There's a huge festival that happens in India every several years, I forget, eight years, 12 years. 
um, but it's called the Kumbha Mela. And the origin of the Kumbha Mela tells a story about the god Indra being very exhausted and depleted. And so the lesser gods uh, take a serpent and twist a serpent around a mountain. And from the mountain explodes a profusion of something called Amrita or nectar. And it falls upon the earth in several different places. And that is where the Kumbha Mela is held biggest festival on earth makes Burning Man look like, you know, an amusement park. Well, the Buddhist tradition really tried to distance themselves from the licentiousness of Hinduism. However, one of the earliest ideograms in uh, the Chinese language is two hemp plants growing outside a house. And one of their deities is Ma Gu, the hemp maiden who wears a necklace of hemp and administers healing herbs to the people. But I just want to say there's always a fringe group in every culture. And in Tantric Buddhism, <clears throat> the use of psychoactive plants has also been part of the culture. And, you know, it's hard to know so much about Buddha, just like you know, we only have fragments of texts and interpretations of fragments and so forth. But there are many Buddhist uh, traditions that talk about Buddha eating one hemp seed a day. Well, I want to honor the Jewish tradition. Um, Machaventim Melchizedek came and visited Abraham I guess maybe 4,000 years ago, and they did not have access to the Tree of Life, but he really tried to uh, make people ready by honoring the one God. He wasn't saying don't worship the God of volcanoes or the God of the rocks, but you know, the creator of all. If you're really gonna like, you know, do your prayers, N not that we can't appreciate a nice rock or a volcano. Um, hmm, but it is interesting that uh, Moses, got his Ten Commandments while sitting in front of a burning bush. Huh, I wonder what bush that might have been. Hmm, what smoke could have been consciousness altering to help him procure such profound wisdom for a better way to live upon the earth? So uh, recently they found out that a lot of the things used in the temples, a lot of the uh, incenses were burned and uh, holy anointing oil. I'm going to come to that in a minute. But we do know that the practice of burning incense, the word perfume means to purify through smoke. And so throughout history, we have many uh, concepts of people, priests, shamans, medicine women, burning different good smelling herbs because it was believed that when you burn these things that smell good, uh, they didn't know they were producing carbolic acid, which was antiseptic, but they were sending their prayers heavenward. So it was a way of like, you know, please help, you know, us succeed or please help my son to heal or my, you know, daughter to, you know, marry well or whatever it is that you were praying for. And we also have a reference that in the Oracle of Delphi, uh, that the women who were the priestesses would foretell the future and would burn cannabis and other herbs and braziers as a way of gaining inspiration. So there's something very mystical about smoke. Um, some people have even like looked for images in the smoke as a way of like looking for signs as you know many many cultures have done when you know this is what they have to work with. It's a good thing Nostradamus wasn't around during the witch burning times. He probably would have gotten in a lot of trouble for some of the books and things that he did. But, you know, we still talk about him to this day. So burning incense, a way to send your prayers heavenward and also to create an antiseptic environment where it might be safe to, you know, pray or worship. So one of the oldest known cultivators of cannabis is said to be the Scythians. And the Scythians were the first people to um, domesticate the horse. Because they were hemp growers, they were able to make rope and fibers and therefore uh, rope in the horses and lasso them. But we also know that they uh, burned cannabis in these braziers and they would create like a tripod and put cloths over it and then they would um, get inside the cloth and inhale the vapors and then they would dance and sing and cavort. Um, but they conquered much of Western Europe 
and it was really their ability to have uh, domesticated not only the horse because of their domestication of cannabis. And because cannabis can get so tall, they invented a scythe, which is that tool that you see used to cut hemp. And you can see how tall it grows and how even tree-like it looks. Okay, so let's see. So uh, the Old Testament talks about a holy anointing oil. And the holy anointing oil is mentioned many times in the Bible, um, but they say that it was made out of cinnamon, myrrh, olive oil, and cannabosum. Huh, cannabosum. Yep, that's what I say. But in the th third century BC in a Greek translation, because we're talking about the Old Testament of the Old Testament, they translated kenebosum to be calamus, a chorus calamus. Well, calamus, even though, you know, I hear Walt Whitman was a cannabis head, I tried it once and it made me sick. Um, it's not a really great healing herb. It doesn't have the market value. Mm. Burned as an incense, I've certainly never done it, and I've certainly burned a few sticks myself. Huh. Can, calamus is also a water-growing plant, so would a plant that grows in water be so prolific in you know, the dry desert land? And the Bible also talks about canne being a fiber plant, and a coarse calamus is not a fiber plant. But can they both some as cannabis is definitely a fiber plant. Didn't we say that we've seen shrouds made of cannabis? So, uh, so the holy anointing oil is also used uh, by the apostles. And according to the Arantia book, Jesus had a core of women apostles, which conveniently got locked out of the Bible or left out of the Bible. But that resulted in women being locked out of a lot of other things for the next couple thousand years. Well, I want to give honor to the Zoroastrian religion. Uh, the Zoroastrian religion, look, there's that flying bird again. They used a plant sacrament called Heoma, which sounds a lot like Soma. And originally, when they were honoring the masculine and the feminine aspects of the divine, they used cannabis as their sacrament. But later, as the religion progressed, they only honored the masculine and no longer used cannabis, but used like a placebo in their ritual. But in any case, it's said that the three wise men were Zoroastrian priests, and that's why they knew about astrology, and they knew that uh, there was you know, this conjunction of Jupiter, Saturn, and... Jupiter, Saturn, and what was it, Venus? The, uh, some big conjunction that happened like last winter, I believe. Um, but it made for like a really bright star. But the three wise men had some inside information. Now, moving south to Africa, in Egypt, we have a goddess named Sheshmet. They call her Lady of the Seven Points. Will you look at that over her head? That's one of those palmate leaves. Wow. And then, you know, if you look on the image on the top right, it looks like something I saw going on the other day <laughs> outside. Um, somebody offering somebody. Looks like a pipe. Hmm. Well, in any case, it's hard to understand all the mysteries of ancient Egypt. But we do also see that they have pictures of a tree and there's people getting something important off this tree. And of course, the symbol of the Ankh uh, indicates eternal life. And uh, one of the reasons that the original extraterrestrials brought the tree of life here is it was going to help them to uh, have extremely long lives and be immortal. So anyways, a hemp juice every day just might be your cup of tea for long life. But remember the Dagon people, they talked about the visitors from the companion planet to Sirius. All of Egyptian architecture is really modeled around Sirius. Hmm. So the building of the pyramids and their uh, placement and how they are facing. So um, there's a book out if you want to learn more about that, but definitely a connection to Sirius. <clears throat> the Shinto religion is an ancient Japanese religion. 
uh, and they have all of their ceremonial robes, rope uh, made out of hemp, their parchments made out of hemp, and on their holy days they burn hemp in the town square. Now, alchemy had to be quite secretive, but alchemy was a principle of turning uh, base metals into gold, and it wasn't only for turning metals into gold, it was also about spiritual purification. Um, and they had to be quite secretive, but in alchemy, they talk about the philosopher's stone and the green dragon. And some scholars think that perhaps they're talking about cannabis. It certainly would be something that could help one to access higher states of consciousness. So many cultures honor trees in different ways. To this day, you may have celebrated a Beltane with a maypole. You maybe have celebrated Christmas with a Christmas tree. Um, but I certainly want to honor that, you know, many cultures have a lot of lore and legends about trees, about them being inhabited by nature spirits, about them being portals. You know, I don't know all the answers or all the truth, but I do know that it is a theme that comes up over and over again. So um, Jesus Christ, the word Christ means the anointed one. And in all, many of the sacraments that are practiced in some Christian religions, what they used to do is anoint you with the holy anointing oil. Remember, olive oil, cinnamon, myrrh, and Kenny Bosom, which became calamus, but nowadays they just use olive oil or maybe they use canola oil, but it used to really be like a sacrament that maybe could even be used topically to activate higher states of consciousness. But um, having had a Catholic mother, the anointing would take place uh, in uh, baptism and communion and confirmation and marriages and also when you die, extreme unction. Um, but now it's more of a symbol than an actual oil that might have any healing or helpful benefit. Not that olive oil is a bad thing. It's great for salad dressing. Um, Jesus' first miracle was performed in Cana. Um, he did it as a favor to his mother. They ran out of wine at a wedding. But the reason why I mention this is because I wonder what they grew in Cana. Hmm, maybe the Canaanites have been there before with some of their magic seeds. And here's a picture from the 12th century of Jesus healing the blind. And personally, I don't think Jesus needed anything to heal the blind. He definitely had some superpowers. But look at this picture sticking out of this rock above these two blind men. Well, if that isn't cannabis sativa, I don't know what it is. So I just want to give honor to the core of women apostles that was left out of the Bible. Now, Asherah, one of the things that happened, remember how, you know, Eve got blamed for the fall of man and they got kicked out of the garden, but, you know, Adam, he was gone 30 days. She was only, she only had a one afternoon stand, but Asherah was the consort to a Yahweh and her plant was cannabis and people would make offerings to Asherah. They would honor the queen of heaven, who is also perhaps Eve. And when they honored the queen of heaven, they had prosperity, they had enough to eat. And when they were no longer allowed to have this plant, they had hunger and they had strife. And so one of the things that you see in the old world is a lot of the statues of the goddess of Venus and Aphrodite, um, they were defaced. No, they didn't make them with no arms or no head. They cut the arms and the head off to deface them. And another extension of this is the witch burnings, where women who were often the herbalists, the midwives, perhaps the elders of the village were seen as a threat. It was believed that if you had an illness or you had a hard time in a birth, that it was between you and God and an intervention um, other than the medical establishment was seen as taboo. And so very often those that carried on the tradition of the healing herbs were often the persecuted ones. Good thing I wasn't alive then. Okay. Um, it was also a great way to like get your land or, you know, blame the pretty woman in the village for like turning your milk sour or your crops infertile or, you know, maybe you were just poor and, uh, you know, a burden on society. But this must have been a very dark time between the 1400s and the 1700s. And they gave us Mary. Uh, you know, we love Mary. Super cool. 
um, Mary, you know, she's, she rocks, but she became the substitute for the goddess, and uh, certainly nothing wrong with her, but they kind of channeled all that worship of the divine feminine into um, Mother Mary. It is interesting, didn't they call it Marijuana? Hmm, Mari. Hmm. So the Sufi, kind of some of the hippies of Islam, would use cannabis in their spinning ritual. Um, but I also want to honor the Quran does not forbid uh, against, uh, it forbids against alcohol, not cannabis. Therefore, it's also been part of the culture. And some really great medicinal cannabis comes from that part of the world as well. I want to honor the Rastafarians who uh, talk about uh, I and I, that you and I are one, uh, that we should use cannabis as a sacrament with prayer. They also call the chillum, they call it the chalice, um, and uh, have a lot of respect for um, a spiritual leader, Haile Selassie, um, and believe that he is perhaps a celestial minister come here to uplift the people. So, uh, Ja Rastafari. So, I love that one of Abraham Lincoln's favorite things to do was to sit on his porch with a pipe of hemp and playing his Honer harmonica. And I know you probably have all heard that both George Washington and Thomas Jefferson said, sow the hemp seed everywhere, because this was a plant that could really help our country get established so we wouldn't need to rely on foreign imports. And people were actually taxed in colonial uh, America for not growing hemp because this was going to allow us to make sailing um, sails and soldiers uniforms and uh, again animal bedding and feed and food and fuel and medicine. Hmm, well what happened? Some of us have always believed that cannabis had healing properties. I just want to honor the Sisters of the Valley. I don't think they're real nuns, but they long believed in the healing properties of cannabis. In Denver, we actually have an international church of cannabis. I have presented this very PowerPoint there. Well, I was talking about how most of the cannabis right now, who knows what it's going to look like in a few years from now, but this plant, even though we've had legalization in many states, it's usually the female plants that are being grown and the male plants are picked off, although the male plants, like I said, for hemp and industrial purposes is fine. But all that stuff that's being grown in warehouses using lots of fluoridated water and very expensive electric lighting, um, those are all the female plants that in a sense are in captivity. And it does remind me a little bit of the cattle industry where it's usually the female cows that are milked because I don't think many of the male cows are being milked. Um, and then in the hen house, that's all female chickens, yeah, because they lay the eggs. Hmm. So some of these industrial grow ops, you know, remind me a little bit of hen houses, kind of females in captivity, women in burkas. So in any case, I'm into, you know, freeing the plants and freeing the planet. I think really for the good of the planet, we need the male and the female plants. It's not that I don't like, you know, certain strains of cannabis and high THC content, but really the seeds are really going to be a big part in the fiber and the fabric of what can heal our planet. But no, uh, cannabis has, you know, is still illegal in many parts of the world. We have become a pharmaceutical nation. If you don't think so, just watch an hour of TV. Um, you know, plants that are healing have long been prosecuted since the days of, you know, the early part of the um, 1400s. Um, we have been told that we must only get well using uh, prayer, uh, uh, penance, and giving money to the church as well as pharmaceutical drugs. Um, but yet, cannabis has been used to make many, many kinds of medicine for sleep, for anxiety, for uh, healing, for inflammation. It is also interesting that we have an endocannabinoid system in our bodies. Really? We actually have a system that is designed to be receptive of cannabis? Boy, that's pretty amazing. 
There are a few other plants that fulfill those endocannabinoid system. I'm told that wild oregano is one of them, cloves, maybe we're gonna see more research on that. But we do not have an endo ginkalide system or an endo, uh, you know, ginsenicide system or gin, anyways, we have an endocannabinoid system and it really permeates every organ system of our body. That's amazing. It's like this plant is really here to offer a lot of healing for us. Well, there's no doubt, planet Earth is in big trouble. I mean, every day, if it's not one thing, it's the other thing. It's global warming, it's pandemics, it's new variants, it's economic collapse, it's food shortages, it's running, you know, crime in the streets. Yeah, we're at a crossroads and it's time to really make a decision. So when I heard about a plant whose leaves shall be for the healing of the nations, I'm really asking us all to reconsider no matter whether cannabis is an ally for us, whether we smoke it or not, or choose to wear hemp clothes or have canvas shoes made out of hemp. Matter of fact, the word canvas comes from the word cannabis. Our pioneer four ancestors who crossed this country in the canvas wagons, those were made out of cannabis. Candace, um, the leaves shall be for the healing of the nation. So I would really like to encourage people to use this plant as a special plant with intention, perhaps even with a prayer. It's so simple. It doesn't have to be this, but one suggestion is Om at 420. It could be 1111 or 1212, but you know, 420 is on a lot of people's minds. I was working at a pharmacy today, and what did I do at 420? Standing in the front of the vitamin C, I just went, Om. What if we all took one breath with the intention of peace? Doesn't mean we need to smoke weed, but just focus our intention on harmonizing with one another. I have great hope for the future. I know we can get really distressed about all the problems on our planet, or we can focus on solutions. So with all the plants that I've studied, here's a plant that offers more solutions than any other plant I know. I thank you so much for listening, for exploring these topics. I hope that you've had a good time and it gives you something to think about. I wish you all many blessings. The Why on Earth Community Stewardship and Sustainability podcast series is hosted by Aaron William Perry, author, thought leader, and executive consultant. The podcast and video recordings are made possible by the generous support of people like you. To sign up as a daily, weekly, or monthly supporter, please visit whyonearth.org backslash support. Support packages start at just $1 per month. The podcast series is also sponsored by several corporate and organization sponsors. You can get discounts on their products and services using the code Y on Earth, all one word with a Y. These sponsors are listed on the whyonearth.org backslash support page. If you found this particular podcast episode especially insightful, informative, or inspiring, please pass it on and share it with a friend whom you think will also enjoy it. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your support. And thank you for being a part of the Why on Earth community.